Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week of this podcast is either an interview with a guest or multiple guests or a solo episode where I unpack some scholarship in relation to computer science education. In this week's episode, I'm unpacking a paper titled Liberatory Computing Education for African American Students. This paper was written by Rachel Walker, Iman Sharif, and Cynthia Briazil. Apologies if I mispronounce any names. You can find a link to this paper in the show notes, as well as a link to the author's Google Scholar profile so you can read more papers by the authors. And you can find the show notes by clicking the link in the app that you're listening to this on, or by visiting jaredoleary.com, where there are hundreds if not thousands of free computer science education resources, including a link to Boot Up Professional Development, which is the nonprofit that I work for and that powers this podcast. Here's the abstract for this paper. Quote, the underrepresentation of minoritized groups, particularly African Americans, is the long-standing reality of computing fields. Computing has the opportunity to change the world and is increasingly being incorporated into our daily lives. Computing classes discuss computing as abstract, neutral, utopian, and unable to cause harm. While everyone needs to be part of the process of ending a multi-layered system of barriers, we focus specifically on why this goal is of particular relevance to African American students. We highlight Dr. L. Amin's Liberation Tools, which state how a sound racial identity, critical consciousness, Liberation-centered achievement identity, collective obligation, along with activism skills, are essential to preparing African Americans to fight for racial liberation. Given that computing classes teach students critical thinking skills to solve complicated problems, we argue that computing is well positioned to incorporate liberation tools. Liberation tools teach students how to think in terms of systems, which is essential for racial liberation. By expanding the liberation tools, we coined the term liberatory computing to reveal how computing curricula can motivate and provide African-American students with practical skills to address the racism embedded in society, end quote. If I were to summarize this paper into a single sentence, I'd say that this position paper unpacks and situates the five pillars of the liberation framework proposed by El Amin within data activism modules. So the paper begins in the introduction talking about how we can't expect to broaden the workforce in computing with underrepresented populations if underrepresented students don't feel a sense of belonging within computing culture or the field. So for example, the authors cite that less than 4% of CS bachelor's degrees are awarded to black or African-American students. One of the reasons why the authors suggest that there is such a small percentage of black or African-American students pursuing CS is because there isn't a very clear connection with social justice, according to the authors. Here's a quote from page 85, quote, Additionally, a vast amount of African-American students are not taught how technology is utilized to surveil, police, and incarcerate their community. In hopes of creating radical change, it is essential to understand the difference between navigating and transforming society. The liberation framework is defined as an alternative contemporary emancipatory school model for African-Americans that is attentive and responsive to the powerful role of racism in African-Americans' lives and is intended to prepare African-Americans not just to thrive in this society but also as racial liberation truly requires, to re-envision society and create a fully humanizing alternative, end quote. So in the background, the authors go on to say that they're going to use the liberation framework, which is composed of, quote, one, sound racial identity, two, critical consciousness, three, liberation-centered academic achievement identity, four, collective obligation, and five, activism skills, end quote. It's from page 85. And the authors note that there are some curricula that use some of these liberation tools, but what they posit as liberatory computing draws from all five of these different tools. Now, here's a quote from page 86. Quote, El Amin created the liberation framework for African Americans because the situation of African Americans has been qualitatively different from that of any other racial or ethnic minority in the United States. Additionally, we take a similar stance to El Amin when she states, the systematic and deeply entrenched nature of racism in the U.S. context has been abundantly covered and descriptively and empirically written about. As such, this work assumes that the reader knows that the United States, as it currently stands, both sits in and promotes racist ideology beliefs, and subsequently creates and sustains racist individuals, end quote. And a little bit further down in this section, the authors mention that although this focuses on African Americans, the curriculum that they are proposing can be applied to other races. And I'll argue at the end, it, with slight modifications, it can be applied to other oppressed groups outside of just race. All right, so the next section is titled The Liberatory Computing Through Data Activism Modules. So in this section, the authors break down the five different pillars of this framework, and then they provide an activity related to each one of those tools. Now, the activities that are in here focus specifically on data activism. However, this is just one model within one subfield in computing that this can be applied. So when you're listening to the different tools, 
Try and think of how you might apply it in a different subdomain. All right, so the first tool is on sound racial identity. Here's a quote from page 86. Quote, Dr. El Amin states, a sound racial identity assists African Americans in seeing that the stereotypes about their group are likely false. Currently, African Americans are not taught their true historical contributions in their formative years, end quote. So by grounding racial identity within facts rather than falsehoods, this might assist students with having more confidence in their own identities in relation to computing. And this is not just embracing a racial identity, but also intersectional identities to understand the different cultural wealth that each person brings to the table. Now here's the activity that they describe on intersectional data visualizations. So students will spend about a week recording data about their identity, and then they will draw some kind of representation of that data. So they're going to communicate a story about their data set of their identity in relation to some kind of a contemporary issue or just patterns that emerge from the data that they collect. And this drawing is meant to humanize the data through the artistic expression that they end up creating, which is a really interesting activity. It relates to my limited understanding of art therapy and even trauma therapy approaches that I have been very successful with youth. So if this sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend checking out creative arts therapies to learn more about different approaches or how you might use the arts to potentially explore data as it relates to social justice or some kind of issue that students might explore. Now the second tool, critical consciousness, quote, is the ability to recognize, resist, and analyze systems of inequality. Students need to understand the roots of their oppression before they can change the source of their oppression. To control the narrative is to control the power, end quote. It's from page 86. So by understanding the roots of oppression in relation to computing in particular can help students understand and analyze how computing may unintentionally amplify the oppression of different groups or the opposite of that in terms of figuring out how computing may assist with liberating certain groups. So the activity that they suggest for this is a data nutrition label activity. So here's a quote from page 87, quote, students will use the concept of data nutrition labels to create labels for existing data sets that contain undetected racial bias. The aim of this activity is to clearly and concisely describe the data set ingredients and to encourage the collection of better and more complete data and more responsible usage of such data. A data nutrition label for the US Census data set could contain information about the possible harms of using this data set, such as privacy, racial bias, socioeconomic bias, and gender bias. Since the census has undercounted African American and Native Americans in the past, the data nutritional label would contain a warning label about representation bias. As a result, African American students will become committed to taking action against systems of oppression because they know how to communicate information regarding bias." End quote from page 87. And I'd argue any student who works on a project like that would learn how to better communicate information around bias. And I appreciate that they included a variety of different types of biases or harms that might be included in that, like privacy, racial bias, socioeconomic bias, gender bias, etc. It's important to explore a multitude of biases that might be present. And having a variety of identities at the table can assist with that. So for, as a quick example, myself being non-binary, who is married to a cis woman, and neither of us are heterosexual, I'm able to better see some potential gender biases that might exist when trans and non-binary individuals are often not included in discourse, or there's a heteronormative lens being applied or discussed in some way. And if there's somebody at the table who had a disability, they might be able to notice and illuminate ableist practices, etc. But if a group is too homogenized, then it might be more difficult to find some of these biases or forms of oppression. But the next tool in this liberation framework is on collective obligation. So the authors mentioned that since slavery has been around, there have been laws that have prevented African Americans from gathering. They might be punished or even killed. The reason why is because they're trying to prevent an uprising. They also tried to prevent this by banning learning how to read and write or banning education entirely. And they mentioned how there were almost like different classes of of slaves on plantations. For example, the field slaves were different than the house slaves as they received, quote, better treatment, even though they were still very much so slaves. This division often put many African Americans against each other in terms of competing for a position as a house slave. So the authors argue that, quote, African Americans must believe in linked fate which is the concept that one person is not free until everyone is free. It is essential that African-Americans harness their collective voices to create social change, 
Teaching African American students to advocate for themselves and their communities in computing leads to more inclusive technology, end quote. It's from page 87. And I'd agree that applies to everyone, regardless of if you are in an oppressed group or not. Being an ally or a co-conspirator is important. As a non-binary individual who has presented and published on trans culture and education, I and my friends cannot do it on our own. We need support from cis individuals. Just make sure you don't control the narrative. Same thing applies for racial discrimination, biases, etc. As a white individual, I need to be supportive of others who are oppressed, but I need to make sure that I don't control the narrative. And although that just talks about race and gender, that can apply to any form of oppressed group. So here's an activity called the paying it forward activity. So in this activity, students will choose some kind of a topic from the data activism curriculum and then create some kind of a learning experience for kids. And they encourage students to co-design these learning experiences with the younger kids. So they are encouraged to be a part of the design process. And the teacher kind of guides this discussion to make sure that things are age appropriate. But the authors note on page 87 that, quote, African American students will realize that they do not have to wait until they are older to have a meaningful societal impact, end quote. Which is such a good point. I've seen like so many news stories where it's like some young entrepreneur, like somebody in middle school who developed something that solved a problem. And so they created a company, manufactured some kind of a product that helped people. And now they're like a billionaire or whatever. And I look at that and go, wow, I wouldn't have even thought I could have that kind of an impact at that age. So it's important to show that you don't have to wait until you're an adult to help other people. You can do this through volunteering, designing apps that solve some kind of a problem, or just generally creating some projects that solve some kind of a problem. For example, check out the interview with Mike Cackley from last week, or the previous interview with Addison Lilholt. Both of those interviews talked about students creating projects that were relevant or had in some kind of an impact on the communities that they lived in. All right, so the fourth tool of the liberation framework is liberation-centered academic achievement identity. And there's a slash between academic and achievement. Okay, so here's a quote from page 87. Quote, El Amin states, educators need to be as direct and relentless in providing African Americans with positive messages about the racial groups' academic competence as society is in presenting negative messages. The liberation-centered academic achievement identity, LCAI, ensures that African Americans realize they can use their academic success to address racism for themselves and their community, end quote, from page 87. So to do this, they provide an activity, and this is just one of many potential activities, and it's called the evocative audits. So in this activity, students use a variety of arts like, quote, animation, embroidery, literature, drawing, graphic art, dance, fashion, etc., to show how data science has transformed their communities' sociopolitical realities positively and or negatively, end quote. It's from page 87. So the purpose of this is to humanize the harm of algorithms in order to be able to actually address or dismantle systems of oppression caused by computing. And again, I really appreciate their connection with the arts. As somebody with multiple degrees in music education, it's something I'm definitely passionate about. All right, so the final tool is activism skills. So activism skills include using computing as some kind of a communication medium or even, or even as a part of activism in general. So computing can be taught in a way that leverages activism. So as an example activity, they provide an activity called the quantifiable action, which addresses the prompt, how might we empower our community to address potential disparities? And they address this through a data analysis of some kind of social justice this topic where, quote, students learn how to advocate for people that are disproportionately impacted by systemic inequality throughout the entire data science development process, data mining, data cleaning, exploratory data analysis, modeling, visualization, storytelling, end quote. It's from page 88. And so they provide some different examples of what might this look like. For example, some of the historical biases in the criminal justice system. And so they will do some kind of a data analysis and then create some kind of a report or communication or publication or media or something that they will then use to teach their community about some of the injustices that are going on. So on page 88, table one kind of gives a great summary of each of the liberation tools, as well as a very quick summary of the activities that there are discussed. So if you want a very quick summary, make sure you check out page 88 on table one. And then the authors conclude on page 88 with a quick discussion. So I'm going to read the very last section of the discussion on page 88. Quote, Moreover, Dr. El Amin refused the idea that it is infeasible to use education and racism by stating, there is no easy path for pursuing racial justice. Thus, this emancipatory framework should not be excluded based on the perceived difficulty 
to implement the strategy alone. The liberatory computing framework is practical because schools inherently have a significant role in shaping students' racial identities, their understanding of historical events, and their ability to work in groups, end quote, from page 88. All right, so that is a very quick summary of the paper itself. I very much so enjoyed reading the paper, and I do highly recommend taking a look at it. It's only a few pages long, so it's pretty short. But at the end of these unpacking scholarship episodes, I like to provide some lingering questions or thoughts that I had while reading through the paper. So the first question that I have is, what other oppressed identities might the liberation framework apply to? So for example, if the tools were, instead of sound racial identity, it was sound gender identity, followed by critical consciousness, liberation-centered academic achievement identity, collective obligation, and activism skills, might this framework be used to help liberate different gender identities and expressions? But what about other oppressed identities or groups? So this is clearly a very helpful framework for thinking of Black and African American students. But if we think of it as a springboard or a model, we might be able to apply the same ideas in different ways and obviously in different contexts. But if we do start to apply this framework with different groups of people, what might be missing from the framework that would apply to other identities? And that's something I don't really know. It depends on the identity that's being explored and the context. I need to think about that more. But I think it's important if we're going to use frameworks as a springboard that we don't just apply it blindly, but actually really think through what about this works really well? And what about this might we need to modify or add to in order to better align how to liberate different oppressed groups? But another question that I have is what would this look like in other areas of CS? So other than data analysis, when you're listening to those different tools and activities, what kind of other projects were you thinking of in different subdomains of CS? I love that they didn't just provide the different tools, but also provided some example projects or activities of what this might look like in a very specific subdomain in CS. Thank you to the authors for doing that. It's important to situate theory into practice which is often not done in academia, at least not enough in my opinion. Well, a final question that I have after reading this, I've mentioned before in similar articles, is when might a focus on activism cause harm to students? So something that I've talked about previously is I, I enjoyed music because I could escape all of the horrible things going on in society. It was my mental escape from suicidality that was largely caused by feeling like I couldn't have an impact on the world because there's just all these terrible things going on. When I was suicidal, like in high school and undergrad, if I were forced to confront these issues, I don't know if it would have done more harm than good for somebody like myself because I was intentionally trying to not dwell on some of the horrible things that I was observing. But to argue with myself, even though I was trying to avoid those thoughts, I might have felt better by helping other people and feeling like I had some kind of an impact. So this relates to the collective obligation activity. Where they mentioned that students will realize that they don't have to wait until they're older to have some kind of a meaningful impact on society. So even though it would have been difficult for me to focus on it, the thing that I love about the way they frame this is, is not just sitting and talking about, here are all the horrible forms of oppression going on, it takes it one step further by going, okay, now what can we do about that to address this form of oppression and change it to have some kind of a positive impact? So even though I was trying to escape those thoughts and needed to in order to focus on my own mental health, I do think that the focus on acting and improving rather than just critiquing and observing would have been good for somebody like me, but I don't know. So those are just some lingering thoughts or questions that I had when I was reading the paper. I do highly recommend that you take a look at it. Again, you can find a link to it in the show notes at jaredoleary.com or by clicking the link in the app that you're listening to this on. If you enjoyed this episode and this is your first time listening, there are well over 100 episodes. I think this is episode 140. The show note includes links to similar podcasts on activism, anti-racism, data analysis, social justice, etc. But there's a ton more of awesome interviews and unpacking scholarship episodes that might be of interest to you. So make sure you check them out. But stay tuned next week for another episode. And until then, I hope you're all staying safe and are having a wonderful week.